worship team, and the first song we're going to be singing is The Rock Won't Move. Um, this song is kind of special to um, anybody who went to Master's Inn because it's one of the songs we sang during worship. Um, it's a really great song because it's pretty much saying how God is our rock, and when, like, when we are in the floods of life and we're, like, struggling, God's always there and he won't move. Um, so I'd love for you to sing it with us. Do you have anything <laughs> well, feel, feel free to stay seated and let it bless you, and as you do learn it, um, sing along.
please stand together with us as we sing a familiar song? <laughs> Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord.
privilege it is to, to sing and play praises to you, Father. You hear the voices of your people sing out praises. God, it's a true blessing. And as a, as a team of young kids and older folks here helping them, we just count it a privilege. And, and God, just to serve you in this way is, is such a privilege, God. Thank you for all those within this body, Father, serving you in, in many different ways, God. Continue to strengthen us. Um, give us that strength, Lord, we need when we come in on Sunday to serve. Um, and Father, we just thank you that at the end of it all, we know you're doing great works from our obedience. Soften our hearts. Open our ears, Lord, to hear from uh, the voices that are speaking today. In Jesus' name, amen. How great is our God, amen? Amen. All right. Well, we got a lot of things that God is doing in our church, uh, and so I want to just, I'm not going to read all of them to you, but if you take your bulletin just to note a few of them, uh, coming up this Saturday is the prayer breakfast. Uh, it's a powerful time of prayer Saturday morning. We encourage you, if you at all can make it, even for part of it, to uh, come out and pray together. Uh, prayer is the engine that drives the church. So we all want to be part of that engine, right? Wrong. And uh, so we're going to join together. And just as a reminder for the men, this will take place of the men's prayer breakfast. They will meet here at the church during the church prayer meeting. Um, also uh, coming up next uh, Saturday night is a single parent fellowship. If you know somebody, if you are a single parent, you know somebody who is a single parent, this is a new ministry in our church, a great ministry to those uh, single parents who have a uh, unique struggles, and so uh, I'd encourage you to encourage them uh, to join us. Sharon Dukowitz leads that here at the church on Saturday nights, and if you don't know anybody and you're not coming, pray for her and for that ministry. Uh, also uh, coming up, uh, Easter's coming up. It's, it's a little ways away, but we are collecting candy for the Easter eggs that you see here in the bottom, and uh, if you want to pay for flowers for Easter, you can do that today, so you see the details in the bulletin. Um, also, if you have a March birthday, make sure, if somebody in your family has a March birthday, make sure to set aside uh, Saturday, or I'm sorry, Sunday night, uh, March 29th, for the birthday party of the Taylors. Uh, and finally, I have a letter that I want to read to you from one of our church members um, who you, as a church, have ministered to these last few weeks. You may not even be aware of it. This is from Eileen Dreisbeck. She writes, As most of you know, I've had a rough couple of months with my eye surgery and the loss of several loved ones. I would like to thank everyone for all your prayer, thoughts, and kind words. Last Sunday, I received an anonymous gift, and I'd like to thank them so much as it was a true blessing. I am so grateful for my dear family at First Baptist. Love and God blessings to all, Eileen Dreisbeck. What a blessing to be able to minister to those within our fellowship. Well, one last thing. We have a, a, a new part of the announcements, the ministry moment, where we emphasize either finances, once a month finances, or uh, some ministry within the church, or life groups, or missions. And today is life groups. And so my wife and I want to share a brief testimony about um, how life groups have impacted our life. Last, beginning of last year, we were in uh, difficult circumstances. We had gone through a pretty horrific experience. Uh, we were living in a pretty horrific situation. Uh, I was looking for a job as a pastor, so we were going church to church on Sundays trying to connect with pastors so I could find a pastor. So we weren't really connected anywhere. But we had been to First Baptist, and uh, we really enjoyed it, and we'd even talked about making it our church home. Uh, but we felt that God wanted us to go and, and connect with other churches until we were invited uh, to Pastor Scott and Lisa's life group, and we attended uh, their life group. And, and we found there a, a group of people who, even though we were new, um, really loved on us, really encouraged us. We found the kind of spiritual um, encouragement and nurture that we really needed. We didn't even know, know that we needed it so badly we were in such a kind of a fog, but uh, God really worked through that to encourage us, to bring us um, help. They, they, we, we knew that they, by what they said, 
and by some of the things they did, that they were concerned about us, that they were praying for us regularly, and, and that really just meant the world and helped us more than we could ever uh, say. And so I just want to end by saying, if you're part of this church or attending or a member, and, and you're even involved in a ministry, but you're not going to life group, then my opinion is you're missing out on half of the blessings that God has to offer you. So I'd strongly encourage you to consider being part of a life group. And my wife Jody's going to share uh, her uh, aspect on this. Yeah, so, you know, like he said, it was a, we were in a pretty bad place. And um, for me, I was very much in a fog and not really paying attention to anything. And um, pretty much, probably, you could say I didn't, I'm going to say I didn't care, just, just couldn't think very clearly at all. And he told me that we were going to be going to this life group on Monday nights, which I was like, okay, whatever. And um, so we had gone, you know, a few times and met with the people. And I talked with the people. And um, I was like, okay. And, and it did slowly start to get to be like, oh, I'm really looking forward to it on Monday night. And um, then he s had mentioned that uh, soon after that, that we were going to be going out and having lunch with them, um, he said, Scott and Lisa. And I was just like, I just remember thinking, who is Lisa? Because he kept talking about these people, and I was just like, I didn't know. And he's like, well, you know that house you're going to every Monday night? And I said, oh, okay. And, um, you know, it was part of that was the, the process of going and, um, you know, doing the Bible study and, and participating in that, that kind of helped clear my mind a little bit and then you know also just the the fellowship and getting to know people and and talking with them you know, you know getting connections just helped pull me out of it too and so you know it was really a very significant thing for us thank you all right as the ushers come forward uh we want to uh thank god for all that this church um, means to us and uh, we want to give back uh, a portion of what he's given us. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you and are grateful for all of the blessings in our lives, the blessings of this church, the blessings of family and friends and um, uh, material blessings. All those things we recognize come from your hand. And so this morning we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that we are but stewards of the financial blessings you give us, and we offer back to you a portion of that to acknowledge that it's yours, all yours in the first place. We give faithfully, we give thankfully, we give gratefully, and we ask that you use these monies to further your kingdom here in Morrisville, surrounding communities, and throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
years since I switched jobs. At my old job, uh, very shame to say, we rarely had family dinners where we're all sitting together and um, we're just about ready to commemorate in April a full two years of having, for the most part, we usually have dinner as a family, and I'll tell you that. I've heard it and heard it, and I know that really blesses a family, all of us. And um, Emily's song she picked uh, just ministered to me so much after hearing my girls. They were talking about their friends at school, just opening up casually, and some of the lives that these kids are are living um, as a result of the breakdown in society, family, and uh, I think just about every teen could sing that. I wish their friends they talked about were at church today. Um, it's so important for us to invite others that we we have a heart for to say, why don't you come to service so that uh, they can be ministered to. This next song, um, the, the kids also picked. As a matter of fact, I, I love that about uh, youth worship. What Bill and I have uh, decided to do is let the kids pick. Say, hey, kids, you're going to be leading it, so uh, what do you want? And it seems every Sunday they bless us. Pastor was telling me after service, said, Pap, I really liked your song selection. How did you know it was going to go with this? I said, the kids picked it. You know, I said, you know what? God picked them <laughs> this, this week, so... Um, please stand together with us as we uh, sing this song. In times of suffering, how we can just give it to God. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be your name. 
that you give find him to be true there's never a day i won't love you forever stand by my side just hold me close for i know i'll be okay you gave me more than Good morning, good morning. Glad to see you all here today. It's a beautiful day to be in church. Good to have Zelma back after all of her long absence, bronchitis and everything. And um, it's real good. It's good to have her. Um, how many had some of that carrot cake back there for between the services? Do you know who made that? Yeah. Eric, Eric Marquard made it, so uh, it, was, it was really good if you missed that. A couple things I just want to uh, throw out to you. The prayer breakfast this Saturday, I'd really encourage you to come. You know, sometimes we have, you know, 10, 15, or 5, I don't know how many we get normally, but uh, prayer is an important thing for us, you know, and 8 to 10, or 8 to, let's start at 8 or 8.30, that's more, I, you have to take a look at your bulletin, but you know, for a couple hours on a Saturday morning, great way to start it, and uh, I'd encourage you, if you've never been to one of our prayer breakfasts or prayer dinners, uh, it's not the typical thing where you call and pray and just a static, I mean, it's always a, it's always a great time, you know, it's all, my wife tries to be creative in doing these things, and so I'd encourage you to, to come out on Saturday morning. Uh, it's, it's so important to us, I'll tell you this, we're going away for a week so I can work on my dissertation that I've been working on for like six years, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and we're, we're postponing it a day so we can do the prayer breakfast, that's how important it is to us, so I'd encourage you all to, uh, to come on Saturday morning. Uh, the other thing is Easter's coming up, it was mentioned, you know, um, great time to invite your friends, I mean, don't wait till the night before, you know, Saturday night and say, oh, tomorrow's Easter, I wonder if, I wonder if a neighbor or something is, can, is going to church. Start cultivating those relationships now. You know, talk to your talk to the neighbors. You know, I mean, if you if you get out there and uh, you're doing something outside for the spring or seeing them, uh, fi- if they don't go to church someplace, uh, they're fair game to kind of bring them to the Lord. If they're going to a church, that's fine. I'm not saying to try to draw them from away from the church, but in any community, I understand there's probably two thirds of the people do not go to a church any place on a regular basis. And uh, Easter's the one day out of the year that they might come, so uh, invite them. Uh, start building those bridges now. We're uh, in what book today? What, what book do you think we're in? Exodus. Yeah, we're in Exodus. <laughs> we're talking about Moses. So I'm going to encourage you to take your Bibles out, turn to Exodus chapter 5, where we'll be. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, take the Pew Bible, find Exodus 5. We'll be looking at verses along there. We'll be talking about it and going through it. So make sure you uh, have one so you can follow along as we go. And we're, we're looking through, to, uh, through today at Moses. And uh, how many of you have ever had a bad day? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand... You're a liar. <laughs> Let's be honest about it. We've all had bad days, right? And some of us worse than others. And some of us, it's like every other day is a bad day. Uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. But um, we've all had a bad day. And um, th- th- Moses 
we're going to look at today is having a bad day, okay? Uh, it's going to start out on a kind of little bit bad. It's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse as it goes along the day. So uh, you're going to see how Moses reacts to in some of the things, and maybe you can relate to him a little bit today as we go through this. Uh, there's this couple that was having trouble in the relationship, and, um, you know, he was, he was one of those that just kind of, dull. he just didn't get it, you know? Didn't talk a whole lot. Most guys, you know, quiet kind of thing, just kind of withdrew, and uh, she was the talker all the time, you know, and uh, she'd tell you a million and a half things wrong that he did every single day so they go to the counselor and they're sitting there and she's they, they sit down and he says to the guy he says do you have anything to say says, no and he just sits there doesn't get it you know and she starts talking she goes for 15 minutes and just going along on 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 and the cou- counselor can't get a word edgewise finally he gets up he gives her a kiss on the cheek and a big hug she's flattering she stops and he looks at the husband and he says that's what she needs twice a week And the husband said, well, I can bring her by on Tuesdays and Thursdays. (laughs) A bad day. Sometimes we don't get over that. And relationships don't go the direction we want them to go, you know? And today we're going to find that that Moses has some problems with relationships, you know? And ours are oftentimes in the family. Sometimes they're at work, right? A boss or whatever. And uh, we're going to take a look at how things worked out for Moses. And if you look at the, um, we're going to put it up here. I'll give you just a little bit of a, of a walk through where Moses was. You know, he starts out in the bull rushes, then he winds up at the palaces, getting all this training as a as a um, as a uh, associate, basically as a, as a child of Pharaoh. Uh, then he winds up going out and seeing his friends, uh, the Israelites, is actually nationality, and they wind up um, being enslaved, and he sees an Egyptian abusing a, an Israeli, and what's he do with the Egyptian? He kills him, okay, buries his body in the sand, and then the next day he goes out, and here's a couple of Israelis fighting with each other, and he says, you know, what are you guys fighting for? And the one Israeli looks at him and says, who made you lord over us? You're going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? All of a sudden, <laughs> Moses doesn't have the support of his own people, and he realizes what he did was, was uh, noted, and it's become public, and Pharaoh knows about it, and so he knows he's going to get killed, uh, you know, if he gets caught, so he takes off into the wilderness. So we go, as you, see, as you watch this coming up, he goes from the palace to the desert, and then he gets to the desert, you know, and he, he uh, was with Jethro, and uh, there he sees the burning bush. We dealt with that a couple weeks ago. He talks to the burning bush, or actually God in the burning bush, giving him instructions on, uh, you know, what, what God's plan is for his life, he tries to push it off and say, you know, not me, Lord, uh, you know, I can't talk and all this other kind of stuff, gives all kinds of excuses. And then last week, we found him going back to um, Egypt. As he goes back to Egypt, he sees the, um, the, the Egyptian, the, excuse me, the Israelis, and he tries to get them on his side, and they, they kind of uh, support him. And in fact, you'll find that if you ch- want to take a look, quick look at chapter 4 of verse 31, it says, so the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction then they bowed low and worshiped so he has the Israelis on his side so they're ready to go you know let us take us out of this place you're the man and now it's time for him to go back to Egypt as he's back in Egypt to talk to Pharaoh and that's where we're going to pick it up the day talking to Pharaoh and so if you you'll take your Bibles and uh, look at chapter 5 let's just start off and the first thing the first uh, part I'd like to look at uh, is uh, verses 1 through 14. And I call this challenging the king. Challenging the king. It's when Moses meets with Pharaoh. And, and as I go through each one of these points this morning, I'm going to have three things I'm going to look at. First, I'm going to look at the message to um, the message that is given to whomever it is, whether it's Pharaoh or God or whatever. Second, I'm going to look at the reply that that person gets to the message. And third, I'm going to look at the results of what took place as, as, as that exchange uh, took place. So let's take a look at the verse, first 14 verses and just uh, briefly let's read them and then we'll um, um, look at them and uh, give a few explanations here. And afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness but Pharaoh said who is the Lord that I should obey him his voice to let Israel go I do not know the Lord besides I will not let Israel go then they said the God of the Hebrews has met with us please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with sword but the king, of Israel, the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from the work? Get back to your labors. Again, Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many, and you would have them cease from their labors. In other words, I got this whole horde of people, you know, doing all this work for me. Why would I let them go? 
I, again, Pharaoh's, um, then so verse six, so the same day Pharaoh commanded to the taskmasters over the people and the foremen saying, you are no longer to give the people straw to make bricks as previously, let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks which they are making previously you shall impose on them. You are not to reduce any of it because they are lazy. Therefore, they cry out, let us go and sacrifice to the God. So they're too lazy and that's why they're doing this. Let the labor be heavier on the men and let them work at it that they may pay no attention to these false words, basically from Moses and Aaron. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people saying, thus says Pharaoh, I am not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves wherever you can find it, but, but none of your labor will be reduced. So the people scattered through all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the taskmasters pressed them saying, complete your quota, your daily amount, just as when you had straw. And the taskmaster, uh, excuse me, verse 14, moreover the foremen of the sons of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten. And they were asked, why have you not completed your request amount, uh, the required amount, either yesterday or today, in making your bricks as previously? So what we have here, first of all, is the message to Pharaoh from Moses is, let my, let my people go, okay? And Pharaoh's answer is, I will not let your people go. So what's the results? Well, the results are, let me give you a little bit of a, of a background here so, so you see this. You have, you have three, thing, three people, groups of people that are involved. You have the taskmasters, you have the foremen, and then you have the slaves or Israelis themselves. What happened was the taskmasters were the Egyptian taskmasters, which, which Pharaoh appoints over the Israelites, okay? They're the ones that are monitoring the work and making sure everybody is going to get the work done. The taskmasters then went down to the, uh, to the Israelites and they appointed certain of the Israelites as foremen over the work, saying, okay, you guys make sure that your group of people do the work and you make sure your group of the people do the work. So these are Israelis. Are they turncoats that they are, are, with, the Isra are with the Egyptians? I don't think so. I think they're just, you know, you're the leader of this group, make sure they do the work. And if not, we're going to hold you accountable. So that's the foreman. And then you've got the regular slaves, all the Israelis that are doing the work. And so you have these, these taskmasters, which are telling the foremen what they're going to do, and the foremen who are passing down to the people, but the foremen actually Israelis along with them. So when they say, you're going to go out, the taskmasters bring Pharaoh's message down and says, you're supposed to gather straw because we're not going to give you the, we're not going to give the components of the bricks anymore. You've got to gather that stuff yourself. They come down and say, you've got to do that. They tell the foreman. The foreman tell the Israelis, okay? And then when the Israelis can no longer produce the number of bricks, the taskmasters do what? They beat the foreman, you know? You're the guys who are supposed to make these people do the work. How come you're not doing the work? So they start beating the foreman, who are the Israeli uh, overseers of the people that are actually doing the work. And so they've got a whole situation that's coming involved here that is very difficult for those uh, that are in this particular situation. And I've got, so my, my theme for this part I've, is sometimes things get worse before they get better. Sometimes things get worse before they get better. Can you relate to that? You know, keep on going downhill. And I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where it seems like things are going worse and worse and worse and worse, and that's the way it goes. Now let me, I have a caveat, a, a little bit of a different principle that I want to project also. Sometimes things get worse in order that things might get better. Sometimes things get worse in order that things might get better. As we look at this particular situation, um, we're going to find out as we go through here that it's all in God's plan. In fact, I don't know if, um, if Moses remembered this or not, but look back at chapter 4 and look at verse 21 with me, okay? 4 verse 21. This is when, they're, when God's talking to Moses. We, we went over this a little bit last week. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. How would you like to be given a task by God and saying, I'm giving this task, and the task is that you're going to fail? That's what basically he said, you know. Go back, tell Pharaoh, let my people go, but I'm going to harden his heart so he says no to you. 
why should I go ask? You know, I mean, it's kind of like this is an oxymoron. But sometimes, sometimes things get worse in order that they might get better. Uh, I was just talking to someone between the two services, and I, I, was, I didn't have a real illustration written down for this in my notes, but this illustration came as I was talking to this person. This, they were telling me how their, their husband's going for cataract surgery. And I'm thinking, well, there's a perfect example, you know? I mean, I don't need cataracts. And so I constantly have to have glasses, you know. In fact, I went to the, when I was out at the last week out of the, uh, with the Army, they had a combat support hospital. I had my gla- eyes checked and found out that one of my glasses is really far out, which is why it's harder for me to read stuff, you know. So I don't know if it was made that way or what, but uh, now I've got to get a new pair of glasses. But you know when people get cataracts, they take the cataracts out, they put a new lens in, and sometimes they don't need glasses at all. My father was like that. And um, my sister Gwen, I don't know if she's listening from Sweden, but I remember my dad got his cataracts and he didn't need glasses anymore hardly. She said, well, can I go get that same surgery? <laughs> she's, she's an angel, but she hated glasses, you know? It's like, can I go get cataract surgery? And do, I don't have cataracts, but put the new lens in there? Uh, th- th- my dad needed it all. And things got worse and worse, and you always get more glasses. But it got so bad, in order that it might get better. Once he had the cataract surgery, it was much better even. So sometimes when it gets worse and worse, it gets so bad and things get better. For me, um, it happened in the military for me. I mean, I was in the, I was in the Pennsylvania Army National Guard <coughs> and there were certain situations where things were not going well. And, uh, bec- uh, and actually they used the excuse of Jonathan's illness for why I should not get deployed with my one unit, which I'd been and, I'd, and I'd, they'd gone from, uh, from infantry to striker and I'd, I'd taken through that whole process and was ready to get deployed with them and they kept me off. And the real reason, well, I won't say it publicly, <laughs> but it, that wasn't the real reason. They used the excuse of Jonathan to keep me off. And I was very, I was devastated, you know. These were my guys. I planned to go off with them. And, you know, we're like family. And, and you want to take care of your people. And then I stayed behind. And um, someone else went over. So they may be behind. I, they may be the rear detachment chaplain. And other things happened that were just, it was miserable for a year. I mean, you know, you think about how things are going wrong. You can't sleep or you sleep and you wake up and you're thinking about how, you know, boy, I'd like to... As a chaplain, I'm a non-combatant, but I'd love to punch somebody in the nose, you know? And it's just upset. And, well, that caused me, all this turmoil caused me to wind up eventually switching over to the reserves from the National Guard. And I go to the reserves, got into a unit that uh, wound up getting deployed with, and I wound up being uh, deployed to a better place probably than it would have been if I had stayed with the National Guard. And they went over, it was toward the end of the Iraq War, so you know, it wasn't anything real big for them. I got deployed to a different place, and because I got to the, when I came back, I got moved to the position I am right now, where I'm training other chaplains. And while lack of money is causing that to be a little frustrating right now, you know, still, as I look back, I find that the agony that I went over, and as things got worse and worse, if they hadn't gotten worse, I'd probably still be in the National Guard today, and probably would not be promoted. You know, because there was only one full bird colonel position in the National Guard, and I was never going to get that. You know, I was a Protestant, and I was, you know, they had a Catholic that was ready to go for that, and the three years just just wouldn't work out. I just know it. But here I get, I go over to someplace else, I get deployed, I have a year's worth of great ministry. I got, I mean, I, I got promoted. So th- you can see how sometimes things get worse in order to get better. And we don't see that at the time. The time we're going through, it's a pain, it's agony, it's, and we're really upset. And yet, that's the way God works sometimes, and that's the way he worked in, in Moses' life. The second thing that happens is complaining to the king. The foremen now have a problem. It's not going very well for them. And so they have a message. And look at verses 15 to 21 with me. Then the foremen of the sons of Israel... That's the Israelis who were put over those. Came and cried to Pharaoh saying, why do you deal this way with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants, yet they keep saying to us, make bricks. And behold, your servants are being beaten. But it is the fault of your own people, the taskmasters. You know, it's your fault. But he said, this is Pharaoh, you are lazy, very lazy. Therefore, you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now, who said, let us go sacrifice to the Lord? Who gave that message to Pharaoh? Moses did, right? Not them. But who's getting the blame for it now? He's using that against the foreman, okay? Verse 18. So go now and work, for you have been given no straw, yet you must deliver the quota of bricks. And the foreman of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble. 
because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. But they left Moses' presence. When they left Moses' presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. And they said to them, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. For you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. So lo and behold, who gets blamed for all this? Moses does. Now here's the leader. He's doing what God told him to do. He's writing, at this point, he's writing God's will. He's doing exactly what God told him to do, and yet he's getting blamed for the disaster that's there. And God already told him that he wasn't going to let him go, but I don't think Moses anticipated that Pharaoh was going to make things worse for the foreman and for all the Israelites. So the message of Pharaoh is, from the foreman is, why do you deal with us this way? Pharaoh's message to them is, you are lazy, and you want to leave and sacrifice to your God. What's the result? The foremen get beaten. And Moses and Aaron get blamed for the predicament. That's the result. Have you ever had somebody not believe you? You ever had somebody that lost, you lost their trust? Whether you did something to lose it or not. Sometimes we do things that are dumb and we, people don't trust us anymore. Sometimes we do things that are right, such as in Moses' case, and people don't trust us because things go bad. Even though we intended to do what was right and we did what God wanted us to do, still we lose their trust. How do you build it back up? Well, one step at a time. But sometimes it's very difficult. I use this illustration uh, with marriage, uh, and I also use it with leaders, with, with pastors. It was used to me originally as a, as a pastoral leader. Um, when you go to a church, you get a certain number of marbles, you know, in your pocket. Every time you do a funeral, you know, and somebody appreciates you, you get a few more marbles. You know, every time you visit, make a hospital visit, you get a, you get a few more marbles. Every time you, you, you know, preach a good sermon, you, you get a few marbles, you know. Um, but if you do something that's really bonehead and dumb, or the people don't appreciate, you lose marbles, you know. And the, the goal is, uh, you can last as long as you, as a pastor or as a leader, in any leadership position, as long as you've got marbles. But when you've done so many things that kind of you lose all your marbles, then you're done. And things things through in, a, in, a, in a, like a marriage situation. You know, you get married, you get a certain number of bar, marbles. And I'll speak from the guy's perspective. And um, it'll be a lot easier because my wife's not in this service, right? No. <laughs> uh, you know, you bring her some flowers and you get a few marbles, you know? You, uh, in our house, it's beans, by the way. Well, we actually literally have beans I get occasionally just so I can feel good. But, uh, you know, you, you, you then, uh, you know, you're busy today. So how about if I take Joshua to work, you know, and, you know, you'll have some time to work. That's great. Get a few more marbles. And I've never done this, but then the, the day comes, and you go to work, you get real busy, and everything goes haywire, and you come home, and you forgot it was her birthday, you think you lose some marbles? You lose a lot more marbles than the day you brought her flowers, you know? In fact, you might be bringing flowers for the next 365 days till next year's birthday in order to, to get some of those marbles back. And that's the way it goes. And, and the goal is you always have marbles. And in your relationship, if you've used up all your marbles, then you've got real problems, you know? And sometimes you get in a deficit, and it's always harder to get the new marbles back than it is to lose marbles. It seems like it's really easy to do dumb stuff and you lose marbles, but it's very difficult to do good stuff in order to get the marbles back. Do any of you ladies know what I'm talking about? Some of you guys? Nobody's answering, huh? Okay. <laughs> Pleading the fifth, I hear it, <laughs> okay? But this is where Mar Moses was, you know? He was a leader. He had, he had done what God wanted him to do. People loved him. Uh, at the first, you know, we believe you, but then he does what God wants him to do, and now what? They're oppressing the, the, the people. They're oppressing the leaders, and all of a sudden, He's lost his marbles, and he's down to zilch, and the people don't trust him anymore. My principle I'd like to share with you on this particular point is godly leaders must be able to stand alone for God. Whether it's in the home, whether it's in the job, whether it's in the pastorate, godly leaders must be able to stand alone for God because you won't necessarily have the support of everyone you're leading. And if you're in work, if you're in school, depending upon whatever your situation is, you may be the only Christian. 
or you may be one of a few Christians. Or maybe you're one of some, a few Christians and you're the only one that's standing for God in that. And so it makes you look bad. Everybody else will do that. How come you won't? But a true godly leader must be able to stand alone for God. And that's what Moses had to do with this case. He had to stand alone for God because he was the only one left. Nobody else would believe him. No one else would follow him. J. Oswald Sanders uh, um, writes this in his book, Spiritual Leadership. The leader must be one who, while welcoming the friendship and support of all who can offer it, has sufficient resources to stand alone, even in the face of fierce opposition in the discharge of his or her responsibilities. He or she must be prepared to have no one but God. There's a little chorus that goes, uh, He is all I need, He is all I need, all, all I need. Just repeats itself. And, and that's where we are. It, we've got to be able to stand by with God being the only one that we have. And godly leadership, whether in the home, whether in the workplace, whether in the school, or any place else, we need to have that. Now we come down to the third point here, and I call this complaining to God because, you know, the, the people blamed Moses, right? So who does Moses go to complain to? God, you know? People say, Moses, it's your fault. Moses, the God, it's your fault. Let's pick it up here at chapter 5, verse 22. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why hast thou brought harm to this people? Why didst thou ever send me? Remember he complained about the beginning. Don't send me, send somebody else. That's when God got mad at him. Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Now the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion he will let them go. And under compulsion, he will drive them out of the land. It's not just, I will let you go. I will drive you out. If he hadn't done what he did, God hadn't done what he did, and had let them go at the beginning, yeah, go, and I expect you back in three days. Now he was going to let things get so bad in order that they might get better. He's going to drive them out of the land. And God spoke further to Moses and said, what? What's it say? I am the Lord. Do you think that's important? How much do you know God? How much do you trust in God? I don't know where you stand with the Lord. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you have a personal relationship with Him? A lot of people, you know, go to church and they go on a weekly basis and you may be here and may be coming here every week. And I don't know all of your hearts, but I think probably most of you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, but I can't look inside and see, you know? And there's a lot of people out there that don't attend church at all. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and don't have a personal relationship with Him, I'm not talking about a, a, a religion, but a relationship with Jesus, then you really don't know God as you really need to know Him. And so some of this stuff doesn't even apply to you. Because... God only pro can promise those that are in his own family that are his children this kind of thing. This is, for a person that's not one of his children, you've got to become part of the family first. You know, if, somebody, if a neighbor kid comes and asks me for 10 bucks, are they going to get it? Probably not. You know, if my kids are going to come and ask for 10 bucks, are they going to get it? Maybe out a 3% chance. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I got my kids back there. Uh, but they got a better chance at it, you know. Dad, can I borrow the car? Huh? Yeah, okay. The neighbor kids comes to borrow my car? Mm-hmm. Okay? There's a different kind of a relationship there. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the stuff that's here, you've got to get that straight first because you're a sinner headed to hell. And God says that if you accept him as your personal Savior, what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we're coming up to Good Friday and Easter, right? If you acknowledge your sin, accept what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and accept him as your personal Savior, then you're in a right relationship with him, and now all this stuff comes to the fore. But for many of us who know Jesus Christ, and I would hope that would be the majority, if not all of us here, this phrase is important. I am the Lord. Moses had to be told that again. Now, 
I asked you if that was important, and I got a little bit of a yes. Look with me, if you will. Verse 2, we just read it. I am the Lord. Look down at verse 6. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, what? I am the Lord. Look at verse 7. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Lord. Look at verse 8. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Lord. Look down at verse 29. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh. Five different times. Do you think he thinks it's important that Moses knows I am the Lord? You see, that makes all the difference in our lives. When we go through struggles, troubles, problems, we have to remember that God says to us, I am the Lord. He is in control. He can fix everything. He may not fix everything, such as Moses going to Pharaoh and saying, Pharaoh saying, I will not let your people go. It doesn't mean everything's going to go smoothly, but regardless of the circumstances, if you're having one of those bad days, or if you're having a problem with a relationship someplace or, or, or finances someplace or whatever, you have to remember the fact that I am the Lord. Say it with me. I am the Lord. That's what God says to us. That changes it all. So he goes to God, Moses does, and he says, why do you bring harm to Israel? Why did you send me? And God's response is, you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Now, I want to take the same passage where he talks about I am the Lord and look at these verses with me and see what God tells Moses he is going to do. Look at verse 3. I'll give you the verse and I'll help read it. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. Verse 4. I also established my covenant with them. Verse 5. I have heard the groanings of the sons of Israel. End of verse 5. I have remembered my covenant to take them into the land. Verse 6, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Continue in verse 6. I will deliver you from their bondage. Continue in verse 6. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm. Verse 7, I will take you for my people. Later in verse 7, I will be your God. Verse 8, I will bring you up to the land which I swore to give to Abraham. All these things God tells Moses he will do for him if he recognizes that he is the Lord. So Moses is on a high now. Okay, I got God behind me now. I I, I got some understanding. God's giving me a pep speech. I know what's supposed to be done. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know the direction I'm going to be going. What's the result? Look at verse 9. So Moses spoke thus, everything God told him. Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel. But what? They did not listen. They did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and cruel bondage. There was a reversal of attitude. Chapter 4, verse 31, he goes to them and says, so the people believed him. Now no longer they believe him. Things got tough. There's that phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. When the, tough, when the going gets tough, the untough Desert. And that's what happened here. They won't believe him anymore. If you're a leader of the family, if you're a leader of the church, if you're a leader in your work, if you're a leader at school, it gets tough when your followers won't listen anymore, isn't it? Yeah? It gets hard. I, I think back to my seminary class, and <laughs> within the first 10 years, I think half of them weren't in churches anymore, those that have gone to churches got them thrown out by their churches, or their churches didn't like them, or problems and issues and so forth. And there's all, I don't know how many there are, but I'm, I'm telling you, there's not a ton of them that are still in ministry. I mean, a, a lot of us are, but proportionately, a lot have gone by the wayside. And part of the issues is followers in the church who won't give proper credibility to their leaders. Moses was a great leader. He was appointed by God, and his people wouldn't follow because things got rough when things get rough in our lives we tend to leave God we tend to say I'm going to quit going to church what good is it I am the Lord we tend to quit doing activities we tend to maybe say I'm not going to do that ministry anymore It's, it's too tough but God is the Lord 
in Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them, this, let them the leadership, do this with joy and not with grief, for this will be unprofitable for you. It applies to the church. I'm assuming it probably applied to Moses. It was followers, listen to Moses. Because someday he's going to stand and give an account for all of you foremen and all of you leaders here. And are you following right? And it would not be profitable for you, the foreman and the Israelites, if he gave a bad report because you wouldn't follow his godly leadership. Now, there are ungodly leaders. There are pastors who fail. There are pastors and, and leaders in churches that don't do what's right. And I'm not saying we should follow them, but if there's a godly leader, we need to support them and we need to understand that they will give an account. I will give an account. All of our elders here at this church will give an account. Two ways. We'll give an account for how we use the gifts that God has given us. And were we godly leaders? And then we'll be called to give an account for each of you and how we responded to that leadership and how you were a participant in the church and how you worked for God. Now, while I remember everything, maybe I'll have perfect knowledge and remembrance at that point. I'm not sure how that all works out, but I do know that's what Hebrews says. There's a responsibility on the, the people and there's a responsibility on the leaders. And in this case with Moses, it was tough going. I would like to suggest to you the principle here is that God does his best work when things are impossible. Amen. God does his best work when things are impossible. You remember the story of Gideon? Gideon was going to war. And so he gathered all of Israel. He gathers, anybody remember the number? 22,000 to go to war. And God says, you have too many. Now, I mean, I'm in the military. You can never have too many, you know? <laughs> you never have too many. But God says, Gideon, you got too many. Tell everybody that's scared to go on home. Everybody doesn't want to fight going home. Well, we've got an all-volunteer military, so I think we do a little bit better than we would have maybe during the draft of the Vietnam War, but 12,000 leave, he's left down with 10,000. I'm sure Gideon say, God, you are not a really smart commander, <laughs> you know? 22,000 is much better than 10. Then what's God tell Gideon? you still got too many. Go down to the creek and watch how they drink water. Some of them will go down on both knees and they'll, they'll lap it up with their hands like this. Others will go down on one knee and kind of, you know, use their hand and, and be vigilant. He tells them to send one group home and keep the other group. The group that he told them to keep numbered 300. 300. He was on 20, 22,000 down to 300 men. The guy says, now you can go to fight them. I think I would be saying, God, you know, and sometimes I wonder, God, I don't understand this. This is not my kind of math. But you know what? God does his best work when things seem impossible. Because if, we, if it's not impossible, who gets credit for us? You know, oh, I raised that money, you know. I preached those good sermons. I wound up doing this particular thing that was decent, you know? And all of a sudden, we start taking credit for it. Or our church is big because we were, you know, had this and that. But all of a sudden, when it becomes impossible, then God loves to jump in. And sometimes we don't take tasks that are impossible enough. But in this particular case, he says to Moses, he's going to say no. Then he's going to start beating the foreman. Then he's going to start making them do all kinds of bricks. And now I can do my best work. And we'll find out about that later tomorrow. The fourth thing we find here is, again, <laughs> we find him using the I cannot talk excuse. Moses comes back to God. Look with me, if you will, verses 10 through 13. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and let this, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. Now Moses starts saying, God, that didn't work out so well the last time. You really want to go back there? And so he says in verse 11, or verse 12, But Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am unskilled in speech. He said, 
You asked me to go back and talk to Pharaoh. I don't have the support of the people of Israel like I had last time. How is Pharaoh ever going to listen to me? I mean, at least the first time I could say the Israelis are on my side, but now they're not even on my side. I've lost the people. I've lost Pharaoh. I'm, I, 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 I can't talk. I'm not very, very skilled at this kind of thing. Right back to the same excuse. Now, I don't know if you remember what happened the last time you said that back in chapter 4, but in chapter 4, 14, right after he gave that excuse, it says, then the Lord was angry with Moses. The Lord gets angry when we say, you don't equip us right to do the work. Because he's equipped every single one of you and myself to do exactly what he wants us to do. Amen. He doesn't ask us to do something he doesn't equip us to do. And if God equipped you to do something and you don't do it, you may lose the ability to do it. You know? Because what are you you to God? It doesn't matter whether you swing a hammer or whether you speak from the pulpit or whether you teach a Sunday school class or you wind up doing a wand at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoons. God has equipped you to do something and you need to be willing to do it. Don't use the I can't talk excuse like Moses did. The principle is God equipped you for the task he desires you to do. God equipped you for the task he desires you to do. And you can go through uh, 1 Corinthians and look at the spiritual gifts and it says he gave everyone just as he pleased. You are equipped. The question is, if, if, is not are you equipped? The question is are you using what God gave you to do? Overall, my theme for this morning is this. God works the impossible through his plans, not ours. This was not the way Moses would have set up things, okay? He had a much different plan. You know, I think he probably thought, oh, well, let me walk in. He's going to let the people go. We're going to go to Israel. We're going to do fine. You know, that not, wasn't God's plan. But God will work his plan, and often it includes the impossible. Are you willing to be part of that plan, regardless of what it is? Because we must remember that God says to us, say it with me, I am the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for being our Lord and our God. Today we commit ourselves to you, understanding that you are the one that takes us through all the trials in life, whether it's family, whether it's marriage, whether it's work, whether it's school, whether it's leadership, whatever it is, you are the God that can help us. And that sometimes when things get bad, we have to realize that you work best in impossible circumstances. As we sing this, Lord, this last song, dear Lord, we commit ourselves to you and what you want to do in and through us. Amen. Amen.
reflect on Moses' life, Lord, and it's amazing how that was so long ago, God, and we can all relate. We thank you for your word, Father, how relevant it is to our lives. Keep us in it. In Jesus' name, amen.